everyone and welcome. We're so happy to see you there um, and some of the repeat guests uh, welcome as well. Today, um, we are uh, continuing our digital lecture series on populism and popular culture. And just to remind some of you who are maybe new here uh, that we wanted to bring together different approaches to understanding the connections between populism and popular culture, that we wanted to start uh, a dialogue beyond disciplinary boundaries, which are usually quite strong. And we wanted to bring in people together from different perspectives and start an interdisciplinary conversation. And uh, we wanted to um, invite speakers also to engage with each other's ideas um, in the discussions. And so far, we actually had quite a seamless transition from one topic to another. So last week, uh, if some of you were there, we had Benjamin Moffitt uh, talking about uh, performance of populism. And he already hinted at some of the issues that uh, Professor Carato is going to be discussing today uh, related to the spectacle, uh, of, a spectacle aspect of populism. And uh, before, as you uh, might have heard, we even spoke about the performance of and singing about populism that was ranging through singing about uh, meat, uh, raw meat bread, uh, raw meat on bread, and uh, celebrity politics and all the other different aspects that could be subsumed under uh, the empty signifier that populism is often considered. And on a final note, we wanted to thank our organizing partners very quickly. So the Groningen Institute for the Study of Culture, the Research Center for Arts and Society, the Research Center for the Study of Democratic Cultures and Politics, uh, and of course the research project, uh, Popular Music and the Rise of Populism in Europe, that was uh, kindly and generously financed by the Volkswagen Foundation. And uh, now it's my honor to present to you our speaker for today, Professor Nicole Curato. Uh, she is a well-known expert in deliberative democracy, contemporary social theory, and uh, fringe forms of political participation. She is the author of prize-winning book, uh, Democracy in a Time of Misery, From Spectacular Tragedy to Deliberative Action from Oxford University Press. And she is the editor of the Duterte Reader uh, from 2017. And her recent work uh, specifically examined the character of Rodrigo Duterte's populism. And for example, the article that made a lasting impact on my research was uh, on penal populism. Uh, so if you haven't read it, uh, please give it a read. And today we have the pleasure of listening to Professor Carato's presentation on the spectacle of the strongman. So the floor is yours, Professor Carato. We are so happy to have you here. All right, well, thank you, Lisa, and thank you everybody for being part of this afternoon session. Uh, let me just do the antisocial act of sharing my screen, but hopefully I get to see um, some of you later. All right. Well, again, thank you to the organizers of the Populism and Popular Culture Digital Lecture Series. I'm thrilled to be here. And I'm actually rather nervous because I don't consider myself as a scholar of populism. My work for the past 10 years has been focused on deliberative democracy, particularly how innovative forms of citizen participation take root in the aftermath of tragedies such as disasters, armed conflict, and urban crime. And in my research, my approach is ethnographic, and it is because of ethnographic serendipity that I have witnessed the rise of Philippine populist president Rodrigo Duterte to presidency. Uh, the pictures you see there are pictures that I took when I was conducting fieldwork in Central Philippines in 2016. Uh, at that time, I was trying to examine how the survivors of the world's strongest storm claim voice and visibility in the public sphere to demand and make political claims and demand accountability from government neglect. And incidentally, I was in the field at the height of the campaign season, so I was also able to observe how ordinary citizens, people who literally lost everything from a typhoon, transformed their everyday experiences of suffering to become the effective, effective with an A, effective foundations of political action, including supporting a populist candidate who gave voice to their uh, unspeakable anxieties. So I'm not, well, I'm not exactly a populist and scholar, um, but I do consider myself as a passionate consumer of popular culture. So my musical taste aligns with the taste of 14 year old girls. And for that, I make no apologies. I really hate people who are condescending to the tastes of teenage girls because what's wrong with that? Uh, so I'd like to think that I was invited to be part of this series because of my pop culture credentials. If you ever need anybody um, to join your team in a pub quiz to answer anything related to pop culture, um, please send me a DM. So 
let's get started um, with this presentation. I promise there will be no Taylor Swift quotes. Uh, there are three points I'd like to convey this afternoon. Uh, the first is a conceptual argument. I would like to make a case for the concept of spectacles as an organizing logic that allows us to make sense of the production and contestation of strongman rule. Second, I apply the concept of the spectacle as an organizing logic to the case of the Philippines under Rodrigo Duterte's rule. I argue that the spectacle unfolds on air, on the ground, and online. Third, I argue that spectacles not only serve to legitimize, but also contest strongman rule. Spectacles, I argue, are battlegrounds to contest the lies and legacies of, of strongmen. And I argue that spectacles have a normatively ambivalent character. And the challenge for scholars and advocates of democracy is to identify how spectacles can be used to promote what Lily Kuliaraki refers to as agonistic solidarity. Uh, before I move on, I would like to add a caveat. I will use the terms strongmen and populists interchangeably in this talk. In very broad terms, I agree with Ben Moffitt's definition of populism as a political style, while I attach the label strongman to President Duterte to underscore his political style of using threats of force and violence to construct dangerous others and justify the subversion of democratic norms. I am not committed to using these concepts. So if you want to debate um, definitions, I actually would like to call or prefer to call President Duterte as a democratically reprehensible actor or a morally reprehensible actor. To me, that is the accurate way of describing him, given his culpability in offending democratic and moral norms. Uh, but for this presentation, I'm using the term strongman in rhetorical terms and not in a conceptually rich manner. So let's now go to the first idea. How can spectacle serve as an organizing logic to make sense of the production and contestation of strongman rule? Well, spectacles, simply put, are visually striking performances that invite spectators' attention. In cultural studies, spectacles are associated with capitalist patterns of cultural consumption and commodity fetishism, and spectacles have gained currency in the age of techno-capitalism where information and entertainment industries not only overlap, but are intricately connected through grandiose performances of crises. And so from this perspective, one could actually have an impression uh, that spectacles are in tension with democratic practice, uh, especially uh, in relation to democratic deliberation. So for example, one could argue that spectacles promote visceral rather than rational and carefully considered responses. Um, some could argue that spectacles reduce experiences of suffering to invite voyeurism rather than reflection. So the picture that you see on your screen is an example of one of the most iconic images of the drug war in the Philippines taken by photojournalist Rafi Lerma. And we can use this picture to reflect on the theoretical questions about spectacles. Can spectacles, in this case, the spectacle of suffering, can spectacles simply be reduced to poverty porn, which satisfies the visual demands of audiences with fleeting attention spans? Do spectacles hold the power to democratize the visual economy of representation? And so this is how I will, how, how I will answer these questions. First, I argue that yes, spectacles satisfy the visual demands of audiences, but these audiences do not necessarily need to have fleeting attention spans. One of the most powerful characteristics of spectacles, I argue, is their capacity to transform audiences to become publics. So for media sc studies scholars, they distinguish audiences from publics. Audiences refer to an aggregate of viewers while publics are characterized by sociability and a shared political imagination. So in my empirical case, I characterize the production of Duterte's spectacle as one that extends beyond discrete performances. Discrete is spelled as D-I-S-C-R-E-T-E -E and not D-I-S-C-R-E-E-T. Uh, there's nothing discrete or prudent about Duterte's actions. He thrives in vulgarity. Uh, but I argue that his spectacle goes beyond his discrete or contained performances on television. Uh, and instead, it extends on the ground, online, and in doing so, 
it mobilizes different kinds of publics that create their own spectacles to contest or legitimize his rule. So I argue that the organizing logic of the spectacle is not just produced from the strong man's perspective, but they're simultaneously produced on the ground and online by the publics created um, by the spectacles um, that the strong man creates. So there is, in a sense, a recursive or an iterative relationship um, in the production, consumption, and contestation of spectacles. So let's now talk about uh, Duterte's spectacle on air. So President Duterte's spectacle often takes place on air, med mediated through our television screens and streaming devices. It usually happens late at night as the president is known to be nocturnal. So during the pandemic, for example, his national address called Talk to the People airs anytime from 10 to 11 in the evening, such that some started to describe it as the late, late show with Rodrigo Duterte in reference to the late night talk shows uh, in the United States. Um, I would admit that his public addresses are not always spectacular. Uh, he usually begins his speeches by reading a prepared statement, and then he begins talking off the cuff. Um, a lot of his late, late shows are rarely exciting, um, but there are occasions when they are explosive. So let me just give you an example. Uh, warning, uh, expletives are about um, to be uttered. So for example, when a volcano erupted last year, he declared that he would eat ash fall and pee on the volcano. A few months later, he called coronavirus a motherfucking idiot and vowed to slap the motherfucker. He is indeed the drunken uncle at the dinner party, uh, which is the metaphor Benjamin Arditi used to describe populists. But Duterte is not just the drunken uncle in the dinner party. He is also what some refer to as a macho fascist, who in another address told soldiers to shoot female guerrilla fighters in the vagina. He said, we will not kill you. Um, we will just shoot you in the vagina for without their genitals, women would be useless. That is the logic. He's not just the macho fas fascist. He's also the bully who threatened investigators from the International Criminal Court to be fed to crocodiles. And perhaps most controversially, he is the punisher who two months into his term called for the genocide of drug addicts in the Philippines. I'd be happy to slaughter them, he said, comparing himself to Hitler. In the book, Sovereign Trickster, Death and Laughter in the Age of Duterte, historian Vicente Rafael puts forward what to me is a powerful description of Duterte's spectacle. Rafael compares Duterte to his predecessors and finds that Duterte's sense of time is distinct from other presidents. As he puts it, Duterte doesn't see history as moving a, along a continuum of progress. Instead, what he sees is the stubborn repeti repetition of the same crimes, the same tragedies, the same dangers. He never speaks of his vision for a better world, only about the recurring nightmares of this dystopic one, the endless chain of rapes, murder, terrorism, theft, and so on, all brought about by drugs. So Duterte, Rafael adds, acts a kind of a bad boy who commands the room with his menacing charm, his flurry of invectives and sexual innuendos. And when we think about this, there are two seemingly opposing yet complementary logics of the spectacle at play here. For Jeremy de Chavez and Vincent Pacheco, Duterte's spectacular performances rehearse qualities of toxic masculinity while localizing such qualities claiming that it is representative of the average Filipino male. So to this extent, Duterte is the everyman, the ordinary male Filipino we recognize at home in the street corner, in schools and at work. But Duterte's dark charisma is not the charisma of the everyman. So in that sense, he is ordinary, but he is also exceptional. He performs the spectacle to set himself apart. So again, going back to Rafael's work, he argues that by behaving irresponsibly, irresponsibly, Duterte places himself beyond convention and the law, endowing himself with power over those who are otherwise obligated to defer to his authority. So that is an interesting contrast. He simultaneously performs the every man while also deliberately breaking conventions to show that he is beyond these conventions 
and as the sovereign, people are obliged to defer to his authority. But that is just the spectacle of Duterte on air and on our streaming devices. The strongman spectacle does not end there. Duterte's reference to the Holocaust was neither a poor choice of words nor a sick joke. And Duterte, without a doubt, was calling for the mass killings of Filipinos as part of his campaign promise of stopping the country from becoming a narco state. That the Philippines is becoming a narco state, of course, is a baseless claim, and I think I have to underscore that. So as early as 2018, scholars and activists have already established the genocidal character of the Duterte regime, marked by the dehumanization and extermination of suspected drug pushers and addicts. And indeed, the spectacle of the strongman unfolds not just on air, but on the ground, as police and vigilante killings targeting suspected drug pushers are shot. So in a piece by Sheila Coronel, a journalist based in Columbia University, she describes how the spectacle is captured by the night shift or correspondents and photojournalists who work between 10 in the evening to 5 in the morning when killings take place. Um, the night shift interview families and take pictures of the crime scene. They bear witness to deaths by documenting where bodies were found on bridges and dark alleys, along sidewalks and shoreline of Manila Bay, or inside makeshift homes in densely populated shanty towns. They see bodies with heads wrapped in packing tape, while others are left in the streets. An in-depth report by journalist Patricia Evangelista documented how a killer introduced himself and another gunman as Duterte. We are Duterte, he said, before he shot Adrian Peregrino and his wife Vivian in front of their daughter called Love Love. So to me, this is a very powerful story when gunmen identify themselves as we are Duterte. The spectacle on air is translated to spectacle on the ground. And so for many, the spectacle of Duterte is a, med is a mediated experience. It's mediated on television, on Facebook Live, or on the radio. But for poor Filipinos, the spectacle of Duterte is an embodied experience. The spectacle unfolds on the ground, not just on air. Poor families experience the spectacle not just by viewing it, but by smelling it, smelling the decaying corpses as they wait in funeral parlors to release the bodies of their loved ones. Spectacle is live as they hear the howling of mothers and the silence of children who are too stunned to make sense of what it means to see their fathers catch their last breaths as they bathe in their own blood. Spectators witness the spectacle not because they are drawn by a visually striking performance, but because their lived experiences have become the sites of the spectacle. And so drug-related killings have become a form of public torture. Killings are designed to be public and corpses are put on display to convey the power of the strongman. That said, the spectacle on the ground is reinforced by the spectacle online. So the networks of disinformation in the Philippines are widely documented. The QR code on the screen will lead you to what to me is one of the strongest studies on the political economy of disinformation in the Philippines. But what I wish to highlight in my presentation is the role of YouTube in extending the spectacle of the strongman on air and on the ground. The spectacle of the strongman is reinforced online through influencers who, one could argue, also exhibit the characteristics of a vulgar and aggressive political actor using the reach of social media to intimidate those who contest the populist spectacle. So the image you see on your screen now is an example of a YouTube channel by an influencer who has half a million subscribers on YouTube. He gained his following among vocal supporters of President Duterte. His hour-long YouTube live streams follow the format of, um, of a primetime news broadcast, which begins with novelty tunes to warm up the audience, followed by greetings to commenters on, the, on his page, which you can see on the right side of the screen, and then a series of commentaries on the news of the day. You'll notice that the graphics mimic news broadcasts. You can see the crawler here at the bottom of the screen. On the right-hand side of the screen are live commenters from viewers who follow social norms of digital gatherings. They say good evening, they introduce themselves, 
and declare where they are watching the stream. So on this episode, you see on the screen, uh, the influencer criticizes a journalist who called out the violence of the drug war. He asked the journalist, well, what do you expect? Do you want cops to plead and say, excuse me, please stop saying drugs or please stop using drugs? And then he goes on to justify violence that the president already the justify, sorry, he goes on to justify violence to say that the president already gave a warning to stop using drugs. The president warned them that they will be killed and that it is the addicts who are at fault if they end up dead in the drug war. The viewers, meanwhile, affirm the influencer's justification uh, for the drug war. You can see um, emojis there that reinforce what the influencer is saying. They engage in the digital public sphere's pile on culture, where hostile groups gang up on a less dominant group in their social circles. So this YouTube channel provides material to intensify aggression. So this leads me to return to one of my comments earlier, that spectacles have the capacity to transform audiences to become publics. Digital media, in this case, YouTube, perform a connective function that disparate audiences can create a public sustained by anger, aggression, and sinister joy when people are killed. And I argue that the power of affect produced by interconnected spectacles on air, on the ground, and online pull disparate audiences together. So in her work, Affective Publics, Dizi Papakarisi illustrates how emotive expressions online allow audiences to become publics who are part of the story. In this example of the YouTube spectacle, the spectacle is not just constructed by the influencer, but co-produced by a public that reinforces, amplifies, and emphasizes the legitimacy of the drug war. The story, however, does not end here. And this brings me to the second question I raised earlier. Do spectacles, hold the power to democratize the visual economy of representation. And here I argue that spectacles are normatively ambivalent. Spectacles can provide the legitimizing storyline to strongman rule, but spectacular performances can also contest populist lies and legacies. For example, spectacles can outshine other spectacles. President Duterte's State of the Nation address last July was much anticipated because it was his last one, and it was expected that he would outline all of his accomplishments in his speech. So he once again presented a meandering speech, went off script, and spewed sexist comments. But it did not take long for this spectacle to lose this uh, for this spectacle to lose its luster. A few hours after the speech, a new spectacle took over with the nation celebrating its first Olympic gold medal for weightlifting. So critics of the president used this spectacle to make a point that a woman lifted an entire nation after a macho populist drove it to the ground. And incidentally, Olympic champion Hidalin Diaz was once accused by the president's men of being part of a network linked to illegal drugs, which planned to unseat the president. So I think these headlines of newspapers of record in the Philippines, very revealing of spectacle grabbing. On the headline is the first Olympic gold medalist in the Philippines, a woman, a strong woman, while the strong man was relegated to the margins. Spectacular displays of protest against the drug war have also been instrumental in creating publics that contest the president's policies. So on your screen, you see visually striking protests that lay bare the brutality of the drug war. And these protests demand attention of global audiences, um, which call for ethical responses around the world. For example, the picture you see on your screen now is taken um, from the funeral of Kian de los Santos, which was used or transformed to become a protest march. So Kian was a 17 year old student taken by police officers from his house on the guise of a drug raid. But caught on CCTV camera is a footage of police officers dragging the boy into a dark alley near a pigsty, shooting him at close range, twice in the head and once in the back. Many, including some of Duterte's supporters, called for a Senate inquiry to hold the Philippine National Police accountable. 
So the picture you see is a sorrowful protest during Kian's funeral. It appeals to our global sensibility of commiserating while also remaining indignant and angry after an unjustified death. So by combining arguments on human rights and the effective dimension of killing as a young, uh, of the effective dimension of killing a young boy whose last words were, please stop, and I, I have an exam tomorrow, civil society groups were successful in demanding policy reforms and putting police officers behind bars. Even the tough talking president who promised police immunity in violent anti-drug operations shifted his tone and declared the incident as one that is not in the performance of duty. And the spectacle actually prompted a shift in discourse on the drug war, albeit temporarily. By definition, spectacles are short-lived. They are forged by visually striking and emotionally loaded portrayals of tragedy that prompt ethical responses, and the public's spectacles create the soul as the power of the spectacle wears off. So the metaphor of the bee swarm is actually a fitting description, such that public attention spontaneously congregates around the powerful imagery, and then they rapidly dissolve as they are rapidly mobilized. But to say that the publics created by spectacles are transient is not to say that this is an inferior form of public. Spectacular publics is a moral achievement considering the fragmentation of contemporary media landscapes, and it does have political potentiality. Now, I could end the story here. Uh, we live in terrible times, so it's not such a bad idea to conclude the seminar on a positive note. But I'm not going to do that because I think it is important for us to extend the normative critique to spectacular performances, to democratic politics as well. While I have critiqued the spectacle of the strong man, I think the spectacle of democracy also warrants critique. So in my book, Democracy in a Time of Misery, I introduce the term hierarchies of misery. I argue that emotion-oriented campaigns connect the shock effects of suffering to spectator sentiments of pity, guilt, and sentimentality, thereby driving them to action. In the book, I ask, what about forms of misery that are not that spectacular? What about slow violence and invisible disasters unfolding under strongman rule? I ask, what is the ethical and democratizing response to this trend? Is effective politics bound to succumb to what Milan Kundera calls suffering contests? And I think it is important to put this out there. I think the Philippines has been successful in generating global attention to the spectacle of the strongman. This year, the Nobel Peace Prize went to Maria Ressa, one of the journalists who exposed the Duterte regime's disinformation networks. And I argue that we can use this opportunity to also think about everyday forms of suffering that are not spectacularized, those kinds of suffering that do not stand a chance from capturing our fleeting attention spans, the kinds of suffering that cannot mobilize global solidarity and attract Amal Clooney as defense attorney. I argue that democracy in a time of misery demands what Lily Kuliraki calls agonistic solidarity. Agonistic solidarity is an ethical disposition that links reason and emotion to facilitate public deliberation about the causes of suffering, the uneven valuation of lives, and how collective suffering can be overcome. And so I argue that agonistic solidarity is a key ethical response when confronting strongmen, populists, and dictators, as empathetic understanding can easily collapse to sentimentalism. So grand emotions evoked by journalistic accounts of suffering may be fleeting, but they can be a force for moral education. And in conclusion, I argue that the challenge lies in translating these emotions to a reflexive stance where we can take a step back, interrogate the basis of our em empathetic identification towards some spectacles, but not others, and offer reasons for our own empathetic action and hold each other accountable from prioritizing one form of spectacular misery over its less spectacular forms. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to the discussion.